today I will be the moderator of this event uh, with our speaker, Dr. Giulio Pugliese. Uh, I have to say I'm particularly happy to welcome you all because this is our first event after the long summer break. Uh, so uh, many thanks to our events team who organized it. Uh, for the ones who don't know European Guanxi, uh, it is a non-profit organization. Uh, we are uh, European students, young professionals, uh, very passionate about EU-China relations. And our main aim, I would say, is to discuss, analyze uh, the, the, the EU opportunities, the challenges ahead in the context of uh, Sino-European relations. And uh, so I would invite you all to follow us on uh, social media and uh, to go visit our website uh, to be updated with our events and uh, articles analysis that we publish on our blog. And uh, also do subscribe to our newsletter. Um, so promo time is over. Um, we can now move on uh, to the focus of today's discussion. Uh, which would be uh, the current state and future developments of uh, Europe-Asia relations uh, with an eye on uh, the roles of uh, Japan and China in the changing geopolitical order. And uh, I couldn't do it uh, alone, so that's why we have uh, Dr. Giulio Pugliese here with us. Um, and uh, thank you once again for accepting our invitation. Um, Dr. Pugliese is a lecturer at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies at the University of Oxford. He is a part-time professor at the European in University Institute and a senior fellow at the Istituto Affari Internazionali. Uh, that's why he was saying he's quite busy. Uh, so uh, we, we wanted him uh, with us today because he is specialized in international politics and economics of the Asia Pacific. Uh, with a particular focus on uh, Japan, China, and the United States. Uh, he has presented and published on academic, policy-oriented, and commercial themes, just to name a few, uh, International Affairs, the Australian Journal of International Affairs, Pacific Affairs, the Pacific Review, and uh, Defense Strategic Communications. Uh, he has also written a policy analysis for the Italian Senate, Oxford Analytica and Japanese outlets such as uh, Gaiko and Toa. And he is a regular contributor to Asia Mayor, which is uh, Italy's leading journal on contemporary Asian affairs and author of a book titled uh, Sino Japanese Power Politics Might, Money and Minds, edited by uh, Palgrave Macmillan, 2017. Uh, he was also a scientific assistant at the Department of Chinese Studies in Heidelberg University. Uh, he was a lecturer in war studies at King College, London, and a recipient of a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, he has held visiting scholars position at National Graduate Institute of Poli for Policy Studies uh, in uh, Tokyo and Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and George Washington University. So uh, without further ado, let me give the floor to Dr. Pugliese. And following his presentation, there will be a time for a Q&A session. So uh, have your questions prepared and uh, our speaker will be very happy to answer to this. So Dr. Pugliese, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, European Guanxi. Um, <clears throat> as you can probably judge already from my bad uh, <clears throat> Chinese pronunciation, I'm actually not a, a China expert by training, even if, even if in a previous life uh, I had taken uh, Chinese Mandarin language classes. <clears throat> I am an intruder um, <clears throat> because I am a Japan expert by training. And Japan is a... Um, Mm, very much an unspoken uh, and quiet leader, really, agenda setter in many ways uh, of uh, the so-called embrace of the Indo-Pacific uh, from Washington DC to, uh, in 2021, the European Union. And this is what I, I would basically talk about. How is it that we got to um, have... Uh, a uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, <clears throat> which was uh, 
something that the Council of the European Union uh, approved on uh, uh, April 19th of 2021, and then uh, the uh, High Representative and the uh, European Commission uh, um, fleshed it out uh, in a joint communication in September of the same year. Uh, suffice to say, and this is something that we can talk during the Q&A session, that Japan was the first, uh, if you want, major power, uh, G7 power and uh, Western power broadly defined because Japan has effectively been uh, <clears throat> siding with the West and the so-called uh, liberal international order uh, players uh, since uh, um, the end of World War II. Um, Japan was the primary, the prime and first recipient of the tectonic shifts uh, that were impacting uh, uh, our world, which is nominally, and you can guess here my realist uh, uh, ontological bet, uh, premised on uh, the re-emergence of China to regional, if not global, centrality and the relative decline of the United States of America. This has translated into a more hubristic Chinese policy and simply by default of having China <clears throat> as a major actor in, in the international state, in the international stage, uh, um, even uh, policies that are meant for domestic consumption, in my idea, for instance, wolf warrior diplomacy and much of China's propaganda is aimed at really pretty much a Chinese... Sorry to, to interrupt you, uh, Dr. Pugliese, if you want to share your slides, so feel free, you can go ahead when you want. Absolutely, this was yes. the full introduction, so, sorry. Great, thank you, so, thank you, no so problem. If, if China even has policies that are mostly and principally aimed at, uh, for instance, exporting over capacity at uh, favoring, favoring its industrial champions uh, or pampering to uh, Chinese domestic audiences, these have ripple effects and impact pretty much on the international stage. And Japan has been the prime, uh, uh, the prime actor there. And it has tried to counterbalance China's rise, especially under the nationalistic uh, and hawkish, you could say, Abe Shinzo administration. And what is less known, guys, and this is very interesting, is for the very first time in US foreign policy history, um, <clears throat> Washington DC has acquired, uh, as is, uh, the foreign policy strategy of an allied country. And that's not Israel, that's Japan. For the first time, the US, at a meeting uh, <clears throat> that I have prime uh, recollections uh, for a book that I'm writing that happened in 2017 uh, at the policy planning staff of the State Department, uh, Japanese diplomats were able to share with their American counterparts their vision for an Indo-Pacific. And guess what? <clears throat> After America uh, enshrined the Indo-Pacific strategy in a more militarized way, which actually pleased Japan, to push back against China in their national security strategy of, 20, of 2017, uh, of sorry, of um, um, yeah, of December of 2017, and then this became the framework through which even the Biden administration approaches uh, the region, if uh, in a more constructive and cooperative uh, uh, way with allies, but still with uh, China in mind. Japan was also able to sell the Indo-Pacific strategy to European players, to ASEAN, and this is really what I'm going to talk about. Why is it that the European Union embraced the Indo-Pacific? And what is our definition in Europe of the Indo-Pacific? Because it's a bit of a global Rorschach test. Uh, it means many things depending on whom you ask, uh, on whom you ask uh, um, the, uh, uh, the definition. And I'm proud uh, and happy to share this uh, uh, also because <clears throat> The nature of our engagement in Asia, the European engagement writ large, but specifically in our case of the European Union and its member states, uh, and I hope you can you can see the slides, uh, um, has much to do, of course, uh, with uh, with China's rise. And I've written an article that I will happily promote by the end of this presentation. I'll try to keep it uh, short to 15, 20 minutes. As China experts or uh, uh, 
China watchers and uh, 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 young uh, policy hands uh, with an active interest uh, in uh, East Asian affairs. This is a story that really needs not to to be to be recounted in this uh, in this um, in this um, <clears throat> in this webinar, but it's worth uh, going through some of the key stages. Um, China has witnessed uh, a more risk prone, some would call it uh, hubristic, some would call it aggressive, but let's just say that it has been uh, engaging in a more risk prone approach to foreign and security policy, which actually predates the arrival of Xi Jinping. And this has coincided uh, with uh, China's um, gain in terms of material capabilities, especially at the regional level. And so what you have seen is that uh, um, China has tried to push uh, and to secure its own uh, national interests more proactively than before. This has happened uh, notably with uh, the uh, territorial and maritime disputes <coughs> that China has in the East and South China Sea. And this has also, of course, uh, taken uh, an up tempo uh, with uh, the arrival of Xi Jinping. <clears throat> also, because of his uh, distinctive approach to foreign and security policy, and more, uh, and, and actually uh, to make uh, this argument a bit more nuanced, uh, also to a type uh, and cycle of action reaction dynamics, uh, whereas the US uh, was more interested uh, and slowly but steadily to push away from uh, uh, the greater Middle East and to relocate uh, its diplomatic, economic uh, attentions and also military attentions uh, uh, to the Asia Pacific, the famous pivot. Um, and so there are dynamics uh, that are typical of a security dilemma where <clears throat> uh, uh, the US willingness to and bottle China, so to speak, in the first island chain, which is this set of islands that divides China from uh, the open uh, uh, seas of the Pacific Ocean, have elicited also a push in the South China Sea to um, claim uh, those um, geographic features, which we should not call islands as per the 2016 uh, uh, ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration, to secure those territories uh, and to militarize them also for uh, um, the purpose of avoiding, uh, being, avoiding being strangled uh, by the United States of America. Similarly, <clears throat> the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute between Japan and China, and this again, I have to emphasize because it adds nuance, because we are unfortunately in a time and age when the debate is being dumped down in uh, um, uh, the Avengers versus Thanos, uh, or you know <clears throat> the good guys versus the bad guys, international politics, unfortunately, or fortunately for for uh, for us, is much more interesting and much more complicated. States such as Japan that understood that the power balance was going to disfavor Japan were reacting also frantically so to uh, the shifting, the tectonic shifts in the region by, for instance, uh, making uh, uh, decisions that weren't well thought over, such as the nationalization of three of the disputed uh, Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, which were, yes, under Japanese effective control, and they were bought from the state, uh, <clears throat> uh, they were bought by the state from uh, a private Japanese uh, citizen, but still this contravened the quiet understanding and agreement, uh, the gentleman agreement, uh, oral agreement, there was between Japan and China not to rock the status quo uh, in the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. And so this has elicited uh, also a counter reaction, an assertive, more risk pro counter reaction by China to, of course, um, dispute uh, Japan's effective control over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, make China's claims. Uh, more substantive by sending official vessels and whatnot. But China has also been uh, uh, clearly much more assertive uh, 
uh, and risk prone uh, because with greater power you know to uh, to paraphrase peter parker's uncle that doesn't come necessarily greater responsibility but also greater appetite so to speak with greater power comes greater appetite because you have greater interests to protect and so China's energy needs, this is the second largest world economy, which is destined to become the first in a matter of a few years, uh, some say as early as seven, eight years. Uh, um, with greater energy needs and greater trade needs and imports, of course, China had to develop also a blue water navy that was capable of defending its overseas Chinese communities, but also its overseas economic interests. And this in turn, of course, you can understand elicited a <clears throat> and rattled the feathers and elicited a counter reaction and rattled the feathers of some of China's neighbors. But China's assertiveness is also part and parcel of the story of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is nothing but the evolution of the uh, going global campaign of essentially Chinese, Chinese capital and state owned enterprises uh, needing to um, elicit higher returns on, of investment, and here I may sound like a good old Marxist, but this is actually a capitalist story. But as uh, returns on capital investment in China were lower, uh, were lower because <clears throat> China is in a more advanced uh, economic development stage, Chinese capital went abroad in Central Asia and all the way to, uh, to, to Africa and even uh, European shores uh, to elicit uh, uh, more and higher returns on investment and also export its overcapacity, which couldn't be absolved uh, domestically by Chinese demand uh, abroad. Uh, this uh, has uh, been, been been catchphrased in the Belt and Road Initiative, which is at the very core, it is in an economic uh, a set of economic uh, um, projections uh, of uh, this uh, very large dirigist uh, uh, economy, which has still a lot of state-led levers uh, dictating also economic activity, to foster uh, mm, uh, higher returns on investment, uh, to secure energy and commodities, but also to foster um, uh, a richer neighborhood in uh, Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, with which China would have then traded. Uh, okay, so this is pretty much also an economic uh, an economic story, and of course, the higher income countries uh, uh, in uh, Western Europe, where Chinese investments have, uh, until the capital controls of 2016, and of course our pushback with export controls and whatnot, Chinese investments in these rich Western markets were also aimed at securing uh, uh, technology, uh, know-how. Um, and potentially even uh, higher uh, soft skills with which China could have climbed, uh, climbed the added value ladder to make sure that its, develop, its development would, would have not been stunted and would have not uh, halted uh, in terms of falling into a middle income trap. This is pretty much uh, a story that China has also learned, by the way, by Japan, uh, the famous uh, developmental state model that Japan exported to its former colonies, uh, Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore and Hong Kong, was part and parcel of the compressed development that Deng Xiaoping really kick-started with the reform and opening of the late 1970s and especially the 1990s following his trip to Shenzhen. So you see, <laughs> there are economic factors that needs to be taken into account and we cannot discount them. I encourage uh, everybody to uh, look at strategic studies and at uh, security and political matters also through an economic lens because economics still does explain a lot of our uh, world interaction. Now, economics is, however, not the whole part of the story because um, with the growing uh, uh, economic uh, penetration, you could say, of uh, China's immediate neighborhood, came also the ability from China, uh, of, of China, to elicit a bigger um, political say, for instance, by having voting rights at the UN and UN agencies uh, among the prime recipients of Chinese largesse, African countries, Southeast Asian countries and whatnot, or Central Asia. But also, and this is a, this is a common, this is an, an, an understandable story with greater economic uh, 
sway, you have also a political sway. But what is interesting is that uh, Japanese decision makers and American and Australian decision makers and Indian decision makers, for instance, were the first to recognize that uh, uh, China's economic uh, uh, story of going global, of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, may have also come with a dual use of sorts, meaning that uh, some of the uh, investments could have been uh, then uh, uh, exchanged for equity or for uh, uh, leases in strategic assets. The famous case, of course, the only case, arguably, has been the default uh, uh, or the, the fear of default in Sri Lanka or over debt that Sri Lanka owned to mostly Western uh, um, Western uh, um, um, loans and the fact that China exacted in return for its own investments and loans um, the Hanban Tota port and the fear among Western decision makers in Japan and, and India is that the Hanban Tota port uh, like the Gwadar port in Pakistan or the port uh, and the accord that China has with Solomon Islands would have allowed and would allow for a greater power, military power projection of the People's Liberation Army Navy. So you see, this is a story that has to do with, yes, economics and political power, but also potentially of the securitization and the militarization of those economic ties. The other story, which <clears throat> I have written about, and I'm happy to share the, the, the this is another article. It's the story about uh, spheres of influence, which is a 19th century story, but it's pretty much a back into the back in back to the future moment we're witnessing right now in uh, 20, in the 21st century. Meaning that China was trying to establish a sphere of influence first and foremost in its immediate neighborhood, uh, nominally Southeast Asia, but it was also trying to dent. Uh, 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 the sphere of influence of uh, India in South Asia. That's why, for instance, China has been a prime, uh, has been primarily targeting not only Sri Lanka, but Pakistan and Bangladesh and Nepal. So you see, these are countries around India. And, and China has also tried to um, advance, so to speak, economically um, in uh, uh, the Western Pacific. And hence, now you see initiatives uh, aimed uh, uh, by Washington DC and like-minded players aimed at denying uh, China's uh, footprint and presence uh, in the Western Pacific. And this, of course, uh, has the potential to create a security problem for India or for Australia. If you have Chinese nuclear submarines uh, uh, docking uh, or being uh, hidden in the waters in South Asia or hidden in the waters of the Western Pacific, thanks to these ports uh, that I've mentioned, Gwadar, uh, Hamban Tota, or the Solomon Islands, you see China can play coercive diplomacy versus India and versus Australia. So you see, there is a military logic here. So why is it then that Europe, of all places, is interested, uh, security-wise, uh, <clears throat> in engaging in uh, the uh, uh, um, in the uh, uh, so-called Indo-Pacific. Now, the Indo-Pacific deserves uh, uh, a whole presentation of its own because it's a very vague concept. Uh, the geographic scope of it, for instance, differs according to the United States of America and the Indo-Pacific Command based in Hawaii, which is the one um, that basically takes care of the Seventh Fleet and of the military assets uh, um, aimed at countering China. According to them, the Indo-Pacific is essentially uh, South Asia uh, to the tip of uh, the southern tip of India, all the way to uh, to the Pacific, uh, to the Pacific, to the Western Pacific. For the Europeans uh, in, in, and the Japanese, instead, the Indo-Pacific includes the Western spans from the Western Pacific all the way to the eastern shores of Africa. Um, now. Uh, I would love to ask a question here, but I understand that it's very hard because I'm seeing my slides, I don't see your faces. But what is important here is that the first European countries, a European country that published a, um, an Indo-Pacific strategy was, was uh, France. Why was uh, France interested in the Indo-Pacific? It's, it's very straightforward. And I'm sure that many of you know the answer. Because France has... Uh, 
about 2 million people, roughly 1.8 million people, Chinese, uh, sorry, French citizens, French citizens scattered in the Indo-Pacific. You can see the, the tiny French uh, uh, flags. These are uh, the small islands and islets, for instance, famously near Madagascar, there is Reunion, that uh, have plenty of French citizens scattered around, uh, around uh, the region. And so these need to be protected, these citizens. Along with French citizens and, of course, territories, you have uh, the second largest uh, <clears throat> maritime state in the world, uh, meaning that France holds uh, um, almost uh, more than 90% of its exclusive economic zones uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And the exclusive economic zone is this area that extends from 200 nautical miles, uh, normally, from uh, uh, geographic feet, from islands uh, 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 and uh, um, uh, and coasts of uh, uh, national territories, and this means that France has the exclusive uh, 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 control over the natural resources and uh, 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 energy resources, uh, fishery resources, and whatnot uh, beneath those seas. Okay, and those um, exclusive economic zones need to then be protected and exploited for France uh, for Francis for Francis con consumption so you see the threat perception um, was heightened uh, at the security level not necessarily because China was uh, you know targeting missiles and putting missiles aimed at Western Europe but because uh, key European Union member states such as France uh, have important uh, um, uh, stakes in the region. This is the argument, for instance, that uh, Hugo, May, uh, Hugo Mayer uh, from Science Po uh, um, underlines in his uh, recent book, uh, Rising, uh, uh, um, Rising to the Challenge, if I'm not mistaken, Oxford University Press. It just came out. Um, awakening to a challenge. The other, other uh, analysts, um, and this is usually more common of the think tank sphere, uh, posit that uh, we are awakening to the Indo-Pacific challenges because uh, we are aligning with the U.S., okay? So it's not really Japan, but it's Japan through the U.S. and the fact that the U.S. is focusing on the Indo-Pacific and wants also uh, even just token European presence, military uh, presence, we are uh, somehow uh, trying to cope uh, with the U.S. desiderata. This is evident somehow in the inclusion of China in the NATO strategic concept, and this uh, the inclusion of China in NATO's remit was uh, uh, insisted upon by the Trump administration already, and this is something that, of course, the U.S. wants uh, pretty much uh, us to focus on. And then, of course, there is another view, which is the one espoused by Nicola Casarini, um, who argues that Europe, in fact, is. Uh, uh, trying to sail through the very stormy waters of the Indo-Pacific by um, advancing a third way, which is conscious of the China uh, challenge, uh, but it's also conscious uh, of uh, the blowback uh, uh, that derives from America's pushback against China, which may very much uh, uh, put to rupture uh, the open world economy, um, the uh, uh, liberal international order and you know this was evident especially under the trump administration but this is also true of the initiatives uh, uh, which are very much protectionist in many ways but also aimed at industrial policy from the biden administration and so europe doesn't want to feed into the self-fulfilling prophecy on top of that uh, that makes china the enemy but it's that still is not and you see that china is not yet uh, uh, for instance, fully aligning with Russia. It's not selling arms to Russia. It's not sending birthday wishes to Xi Jinping, uh, to, to Putin. Xi Jinping clearly is trying to maintain a, a neutral stance, a sitting in the fence, but yes, it's cozier to Russia, but it's not fully aligning. And the more we push back against China and the more we put China in the same uh, category and basket of China, we are going to make China the enemy that is not. And so this is the third way argument that Nicola Casalini, for instance, uh, espouses. My answer, in fact, uh, 
and it's the one that I espouse in the uh, article that I will share with you and that you can you're free to look up at the end of this presentation is that yes uh, there is a growing awareness of the China challenge yes there is an alignment on some issues with the US but that alignment with the US is guarded and it's guarded also because we are aware of the similarities between the Biden and Trump administration we have different interests Germany for instance is very much invested in the Chinese market, which is destined to become the largest uh, of the world in the next few years. Um, and so you want to promote for win-win complementarities while guarding yourself from the economic security risks that derive from China. But at the same time, we want to make sure that there is somewhat of, a, uh, uh, of an architecture uh, and of common rules of the game but preserve uh, essentially what are small and medium players because the European Union is nominally a great power, a superpower, but we are still made up of member states uh, and our security and prosperity really rests on uh, the architecture of the so-called liberal international order. And we need to be very conscious of the risks and the challenges that come to that architecture, not just from China, but potentially from another Trump administration, which may well be around the corner, or a Pompeo administration, or, you know, a more downright isolationist, protectionist, uh, uh, unilateralist um, uh, American approach. My argument is that, yes, so uh, you see I'm espousing the Meyer take and I'm espousing uh, the Casalini take, but I'm also saying that uh, Europe is invested in the region because of mercantile interests, because we are behaving also in more protectionist uh, ways. And I'll get to the argument in a second. Now, we want to keep the rules of the game open and we want to keep, uh, we want to basically preserve uh, what, li what little and important is left of, um, of a security um, and international law architecture. And this was evident, for instance, with the ruling of 2016 against the China's maximalist claims in the South China Sea. UNCLOS uh, uh, is the key uh, treaty, uh, multilateral treaty and body of uh, laws of international law that regulates basically uh, the uh, uh, open seas uh, and uh, maritime disputes. Um, and that has gone hand in hand with military signaling and presence operations, not just uh, um, in, uh, mm, uh, in partnership with Japan or Korea to enforce uh, uh, sanctions against North, uh, against uh, uh, North Korea's nuclear and missile breakout, but also by sailing and doing military exercises with like-minded players, including the US, uh, in the South China Sea uh, or um, in the Pacific Ocean, or by having these ships uh, transiting there. Now you've had recently German fighters going all the way to Australia for pitch black exercises, that's the name, a very response force of uh, a bunch of planes. And then the, these planes and these fighter jets have gone to do uh, operations with uh, with uh, their Japanese counterparts uh, uh, in the East China Sea. So this is not deterrence in the strict sense, but it's a way to buttress the constitutional law that regulates the freedom of navigation and the freedom of, uh, of navigation in these areas. So you see, this is aimed at making a point, uh, making a point uh, mm, uh, specific uh, to... Uh, uh, um, uh, international law and so to multilateralism writ large. Uh, it's very unlikely that uh, Europe will have a meaningful naval presence in the South China Sea and I'm getting to the conclusion. Now where security meets my argument uh, on uh, mercantile projection, it's on connectivity. Connectivity is this, is this buzzword that means a lot of things. It could also mean digital connectivity at home but as we intended uh, in this presentation and normally in, in this kind of groupings, it is really a strategic use of government financing for the purpose of uh, infrastructure diplomacy, but also the development of soft skills and capacity building. They also may fall in connectivity to empower um, recipient states, normally emerging economies and developing countries. And while making them richer, you are also trying to uh, bolster their security 
And this is evident from a new project that the European Union has launched, which will now be more synergetic with the Indo-Pacific strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which is the Enhancing Security Cooperation in and with Asia. The acronym is EZIWA, but uh, the actual name, uh, in, which I forgot to include in the slide, is Enhancing Security Cooperation in and with Asia. This is led by Germany's GIZ and France's uh, Expertise France, which is their government financing, uh, uh, development financing agencies. What is interesting is that the prime targets uh, are mostly Southeast Asian countries, plus uh, India and uh, uh, Japan and South Korea. But you see that the target of our security engagement is really, and the political commitment is really India and Southeast Asia. And the reason is because these markets are booming and because our government financing projects uh, are growingly going hand in hand with our political security commitments. And so you have public private partnerships that favor our industrial champions. And so, for instance, the Netherlands is very interested in selling fintech and digital goods <clears throat> to these countries. And that's why the Netherlands sends ships and planes, um, actually more planes, to the Indo-Pacific, because the markets uh, recognize that uh, it's good to have a close political connection Southeast Asian and Indians with uh, European players to diversify away from China as well, or from Japan, which is invested in the China pushback, keeping up a third way. And by keeping up a third way, you also then give uh, luc lucrative contracts uh, to major European players. And to conclude, uh, this logic is very evident, uh, and you probably don't know about uh, this document, from the, Europe, the Italian contribution to the EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific, which is an implementation document, which is publicly av available in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, where Italy actually spells out that we are a merchant nation, and I'm Italian, that's why I say we, and our, the nature of our security engagement for connectivity and capacity building, for instance, with Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia, is to strengthen bilateral cooperation and create new opportunities for the Italian economic system. And so you see that there is a mercantile logic at play. And this uh, I conclude with uh, a window on the article that actually just came out. It's open access. This is the title. You can take a screenshot and uh, I'm happy I'm happy to now answer your uh, your questions. Let me thank uh, Dr. Pugliese for the presentation. It was very, very interesting, especially because, as you said, uh, we are China watchers here. Uh, so I think, uh, and maybe I can speak for many of us by saying this, that it is extremely important in order to understand China, to also look at it from a different perspective, an external perspective. So having someone here uh, with a background uh, on, on uh, Japan and uh, then we mentioned the uh, United States and the European Union, I think it's it's precious for us. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and on that point, uh, you guys feel absolutely free to correct me or disagree. I, I take no umbrage whatsoever. Indeed, indeed. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again. And um, so uh, I will, uh, before we, we wait for our questions uh, to come, I will take advantage of my role here uh, to um, first kick off with, with my own questions. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you, um, both in your article uh, that you were mentioning before, and maybe we can then write the title in the chat so that everybody uh, who is interested can go and have a look at it. So both in the article and in your presentation, you were mentioning uh, the EU perspective of Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, also in relations to Japan and the United States. And the member states' uh, perspective uh, and their version of the strategy, in particular, you talk about France and, and Italy, for example, uh, but we have uh, Germany and the Netherlands. So um, after that, you talked about the mercantile rationale behind the Indo-Pacific approach, um, which also uh, can have protectionist implications in a way. So my question is, uh, these mercantile interests uh, would be uh, able to hinder 
the unified uh, EU approach to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so, for example, given the central role that France has when it comes to setting the agenda of uh, EU relations with the Indo-Pacific, so what's your views on that? Absolutely. Um, it's, it works both ways. So, <clears throat> on one hand, of course, uh, you have uh, um, a um, uh, green transition and digitalization strategy uh, that is also aimed uh, at fostering uh, and promoting uh, European champions uh, uh, worldwide. And this is uh, done uh, through the famous next generation EU budget uh, reallocation and uh, the fact that you have lots of monies for fostering uh, these transitions. And by virtue of uh, having uh, important players, uh, uh, especially in green technologies uh, and to some extent also in uh, digital technologies, but Europe is, is rather actually uh, is quite weak compared to China, to the US and China. You're trying to also uh, make sure that um, um, the uh, first mover advantage uh, of our industrial European industrial champions become um, standard setters. This is the so-called, this is part and parcel of the so-called Brussels effect. Uh, whereas for instance, uh, by having not just uh, major uh, companies worldwide setting standards, but having regulation that is exported, you're also able to then somehow um, manipulate the preferences uh, for specific uh, technologies uh, because it respects and abides by certain standards. Um, this being said, uh, and of course, what is important to uh, remind our guests here today is that, as I mentioned in the article, uh, with Brexit, uh, uh, we have lost an important voice in favor of um, uh, an open uh, market economy within the Union with uh, strong anti-competitive, with strong uh, <clears throat> um, uh, compet com competition elements. Um, market-based competition elements. Uh, now the key players uh, of the, the EU, are, by sheer size, I mean, are Germany, France, and Italy. Italy, it's a different story, but let's say Italy, let's include Italy. Um, all of these players are strong dirigis players that have a, a statist uh, uh, approach uh, to um, economic uh, to economic interaction. And France, for instance, has been famous. The word dirigisme comes from France. France has been famous for uh, uh, building a synergy between the state and its own industrial champions and favoring, favoring its own industrial champions and excellences. Um, and Germany and France in particular are pushing the council now to have this anti-coercive uh, um, law and to have these uh, more, uh, um, I would say, um, dual um, uh, um, kinds of initiatives aimed uh, at China and uh, economic security, also against the US potentially, but also at industrial policy, in favoring really their own industrial champions. One key uh, example has been the attempt at merging uh, uh, railway technological, uh, ray, uh, railway, high speed railway technology providers and uh, uh, railway providers in Germany and France. I think it's Armstrong, Alstom, and Alstom and Siemens, which would have dominated uh, uh, the European market if that uh, mer attempted merger had gone uh, through European Union anti competition. Um, uh, pro-competition laws, uh, but it didn't go through. So you see, <clears throat> there is a strong uh, preference uh, in France, Germany, and Italy for this kind of industrial protection, industrial policies uh, kind of uh, approach. Uh, and the voices uh, such as Sweden, uh, Spain, and others uh, in favor of more competition uh, are, uh, are, are weaker. 
and so China becomes also a fig leaf sometimes for effectively for industrial policy. Now, when we are talking about the engagement abroad, uh, the fact that the government financing um, happens more and more often through uh, public-private partnerships uh, suggests that, yes, there are also competitive elements uh, that hinder potentially at cooperation, um, at, co at real cooperation within the union. And so uh, there are elements already uh, um, that uh, might portend um, <laughs> a, a more disjointed Euro Euro European engagement uh, uh, precisely because of these competitive dynamics. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. I think it's, uh, it will be very, very interesting to see uh, what is next, what comes next in terms of uh, uh, EU um, policy um, for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so I would now give the floor to Francesco Di Paola, who uh, was uh, willing to ask the question by himself. Francesco, the floor is yours. <coughs> Hi, Jessica. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. And thanks a lot, uh, Professor Pugliese, for this opportunity. Um, I just want to address my question directly to you, Professor Pugliese, because I don't want to read uh, a biblical page here in the chat, because it's going to be... Uh, I, I will try to keep it short, but I want to give a little bit of context before. So... Mm -hmm. I just had the impression that um, when we were talking, for example, about the role of France or the role of Europe in the Indo-Pacific, we didn't we didn't consider the elephant in the room. That in which case is the AUKUS. Um, so I wanted to my my question is actually related to the recent development about the AUKUS and what happened to France. We try to be more proactive also in the military field in the Indo-Pacific. So. My impression is that there are nations in the Indo-Pacific, namely Japan and India and also Australia, that are more than happy and willing to cooperate with, with European partners in the, cost of, in the military field as well in the economics. As you mentioned, we have seen uh, bilateral and two plus two meetings between the Japanese and the, and the Germans, for instance, and also the UK involvement. Um, but when it comes to Americans, it seems that they don't see a big role for us in the region. And I also had the, the opportunity to ask those que this, exact these questions uh, to two American analysts and commentators, and actually they confirmed my opinion, that they see, yes, there is some space for the Europeans, but marginal space. They don't see big involvement. They, they prefer to cooperate with the, with the Asian partners, and actually they don't want us too much involved. They they said frankly uh, in this in these terms actually they, they, I gave I gave I, I obtained a very honest feedback from from them so I want to ask how do you see um, how do you foresee the space for in I don't know improvement or increasing cooperation in the area considering um, I don't know this assessment do you see any any improvement in the near future for for European space in the region maybe in the context of Quad Plus where I think that nations like UK and France are already um, are already working on it thanks a lot thank you well don't tell the French about um... Yeah, uh, AUKUS, because they're still uh, pretty angry at it, but uh, not with the new government, maybe, we're trying to mentize. Um, I'll address your question, which is basically many questions, um, because it's about the expectations of resident players uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific for, for our engagement. And I include the US among the resident players, right? Because it has been uh, projecting its power since the end of World War II, uh, through uh, a set of military bases uh, in Korea, Japan, uh, Guam, Philippines, and so on and so forth. Um, so, I think that what is happening is that um, Japan and India uh, are diversifying uh, their um, partnerships. They are diversifying their partnerships because they realize that uh, U.S. engagement cannot be taken uh, at face value. Think of 
a more isolationist president. And there are isolationist tendencies uh, that date back from the Obama years. Uh, mm, because, of course, of uh, the uh, trauma of the uh, forever wars, as Biden called them, in the greater Middle East, but also of budgetary issues. So there is a, a, a potential uh, need, there is a need to diversify uh, security partnerships, the rostrum of security partnerships, also because of, uh, of US disengagement, or conversely of uh, a US uh, engagement that is uh, too, um, uh, too confrontational against China. But this is probably India's position. Um, while uh, uh, the US actually does have expectations, uh, it does have expectations, especially on the economic realm. This is evident from the NATO agenda. And this is evident from uh, the strategy of minilaterals that the US is enforcing. So this goes uh, to the core of your mentioning the Quad, the AUKUS, uh, with uh, uh, Trump's arrival, with Trump's disengagement from uh, U the UN and the UN agencies, of course, China as the largest, uh, second largest world economy and big donor has cleverly occupied the vacuum left by the US. And so we are arriving at uh, the stage where the traditional multilateral institutions, such as those in China and the UN, are not working very well. They are at a standstill. We've seen that, for instance, with the war in Ukraine, we've seen that with Syria. So what has happened is that the US, especially under the Biden administration, has enforced a, a strategy aimed at China through minilaterals. And so it has uh, injected new life in the Quad, which was a maritime and is nominally a maritime security dialogue. But now, the remit of the Quad has extended to vaccine diplomacy, um, study groups uh, aimed at emerging technologies, uh, securing the supply chains, uh, rare earth materials and semiconductors. So you see, um, this is pretty much uh, what is going on with uh, AUKUS, which, yes, is about giving nuclear submarine technology to Australia. But it's also about um, trying to leapfrog uh, um, dual use technological change in uh, so mostly technology used for military purposes um, where the used where Australia you the US and, Eng and the UK detain key key assets and so quantum computing artificial intelligence and whatnot you see there are echoes with the quad this by the way is what the US is pushing with Europe uh, through the Trade and Technology Council, hmm? which is about standard setting, it's about export controls, it's about uh, potential uh, development of new technologies together. So this is effectively a minilateral strategy um, aimed also at the economic containment of China. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm very cynical here, it's evident from the CHIP Alliance and from the new uh, measures uh, unveiled by the US, but clearly there is the willingness to slow down China's technological catch up and not necessarily in, uh, you know, <clears throat> not necessarily in um, the military sector. It's not just, uh, it's not just uh, military civil relations, uh, the so-called military civil fusion uh, that preoccupies America. But it's also the technological catch-up and the fact that China might become um, a prime mover, uh, you know, might gain prime mover advantage uh, in, for instance, key sectors such as uh, 5G. That's the first, uh, you know, smoking gun of what has happened, meaning that Huawei was likely going to become the dominant actor in 5G technology because of uh, state subsidies, uh, course, uh, distorted market practices, and the fact that it was relatively cheap, but the quality is so high. And so what has happened is that um, US export controls uh, <clears throat> that extended also to Western uh, uh, companies that detained the 25% of American technology 
would make those export controls would make Chinese products substandard because Huawei could not get hold of key software and key technology made in America or made in Europe or made in Taiwan with an American component. This is also aimed at slowing down China's technological catch up. We, you know, as Confucius said, uh, you should call things with their name. <laughs> so this is my cynical understanding of what's going on. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, you know, we, we are living with it. Uh, we're trying to navigate the waters. Um, and, and, and this is what the US government, for instance, wants uh, from Europe, of course, more export controls. Um, uh, more um, um, more um, denial of our technology, such as, um, for instance, uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, uh, chip uh, ASML. Yes, chip producing machines, um, and, um, and 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 the like. On the security side, uh, however, I think that the U.S. is happy that uh, that there is a presence because it's uh, it's military signaling. It's still expensive for us, but it's you know it's 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 showing the flag and it's making the point that uh, the U.S. and Japan are not alone uh, in lamenting uh, and criticizing uh, Chinese behavior. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the U.S. perhaps expects uh, now with the war in Ukraine, uh, uh, would expect uh, us taking good care of our neighborhood more. That's uh, certainly something that I, uh, I envision. So that the US can disengage uh, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and focus uh, uh, on, on the, on the so-called Indo-Pacific, on China. Um, and uh, yeah, I am not sure that Japan, uh, Japan's diversification, uh, for instance, uh, of its partnerships with the two plus twos, with Germany, the UK, and whatnot, uh, uh, is re really about uh, um, substituting uh, the centrality of the US-Japan alliance. Because security-wise, the US and Japan are are like you know. But that's if you want to understand America's approach to China, you understand the US Japan alliance, really. Uh, because it's their prime ally, it's uh, an unsinkable aircraft career. And they see eye to eye on many things, including Taiwan, uh, Japan, and, uh, and the US. And so, what, what I think uh, is the expectation on Japan's and America's side again uh, is really yes, my, some military presence and, and signaling, but also uh, more economic security. Thank you. Uh, from, from Europe. Thank you, Dr. Pugliese. I'm sorry to interrupt the discussion. Uh, it was it was extremely interesting. We could, uh, for me, we could uh, keep talking for hours. Um, I I can uh, just um, propose you to answer very very quickly in a Thank nutshell. Uh, last question. Uh, that came from uh, Lucian De Boni, who said, um, as a realist, you understand international politics as being primarily structural. Uh, and he said, uh, this was clear in your extremely instructive presentation. Um, I know that, uh, this is Lucian, he says, I know that realists defend uh, their theoretical tools to the death, but as you're thinking, uh, not being influenced by the Ukrainian, Ukraine invasion, which seems to have launched a renewed focus on the role of agency, particularly for autocratic great powers, Agency, he says, understood in a broad sense of domestic politics. I know this is a very broad topic, but oh, uh, no, no, just no. in a nutshell. I could go on forever. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm not a member of a sect, uh, so even if it's, uh, you know, it finishes by ism or ist, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I am not uh, going to church every Sunday, you know, uh, where Mifsheimer is, you know, the priest or something. No, absolutely not. And secondly, I'm delighted you asked this question, because if I actually were of a church, I am of a neoclassical realist school, which allows for agency within structural trends. I absolutely think that, you know, your, your, your question is bang on right. It's agency, but it's agent, agency within structural constraints. 
it's an agency within structural constraints. And so um, it does make a difference. It does make a difference that uh, 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 Japan finds itself uh, between two giants, meaning the US and China, because it, Japan had to navigate between uh, um, uh, what happens among those two giants and how the power differential will favor one over the other. Uh, Putin, for all his irrationality and his gamble, and it, in my opinion, uh, he misread totally the situation, he was under the impression that the US was going to focus on China. The U.S. was not going to, you know, uh, get embroiled in another war in Ukraine. That the Ukrainians were like one, uh, una faccia, una razza, as uh, the Italians used to say of the Greeks. You know, one race, one ra one face, one race. So, you know, they would have welcomed uh, <clears throat> the new um, the new puppet uh, autocrat teletransported uh, from uh, Moscow and Kiev. Um, and they misread Europe. They thought that perhaps, you know, we were going to depend so much on Russian gas and that we were, we would have capitulated immediately. And so I, um, I think that, uh, you know, Putin himself was a hard uh, believer in uh, the structural trends of time, but, but, that the US was going to have uh, its own attentions elsewhere. Um, and uh, certainly, even if he even if he weren't being, paying attention to the structural trends, the structural trends will get back to Putin, <laughs> meaning that the U.S. is still the, the, uh, the most important player in international politics. Europe um, is backing uh, Ukraine uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, wishing for the war to end on our terms because we don't want that nasty guy as our neighbor. Um, and... Uh, and and essentially, you know, this is power. Uh, this is power relations, uh, and Putin, Putin got it wrong. Um, Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for Can your... I add something, something very quickly. Indeed, uh, please. So, speaking of the economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and going back to uh, going back to um, to Russia, uh, to Russia, new Russia's war in Ukraine. One key. A part of the European involvement in the Indo-Pacific, uh, which is also a security one, which might happen in the event of a Taiwan crisis scenario of an important scale, is that we replicate uh, the tough economic sanctions that we launched against uh, Russia. And they will hurt Europe, eh? big time, because yes, okay, gas, uh, absolutely, and definitely it's going to be a tough winter. But, you know, Closing the doors to a, such a big economy like China, because it's gonna it's gonna be painful. It's gonna be painful, and uh, and China is not gonna feel the pain as uh, <clears throat> as quickly as, as 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 Russia is, because Russia's economy is the size of South Korea or Spain. So it's it's a large country, but it's not that economically big. Thank you. I think this is a this is very interesting. This is a very interesting uh, point to, to think of when we also uh, ask ourselves about the role that the EU might play in a crisis, potential crisis of the um, Taiwan Strait. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pugliese, for being with us. Uh, it's been uh, enlightening, and I'm sure I can speak uh, on behalf of everyone here. And thank you to our participants and to the events team uh, who has been coordinating all this.